Hi, everybody. This is chapter four, which is ethics in psychology research. Now, you know a lot of this stuff because you are working on your city training, which you must complete. And so a lot of this is in included in this. So the first half of this chapter, we're going to talk about human subjects research. And in the second uh, second portion of this, we are going to talk about animal research. So let's go ahead and get some uh, information, some what you think uh, from about research in general. So let's go ahead and start with this question. Is research on human subjects ethical at all? That's what that question is asking. Okay, now that you've answered that, answer this question. Is research on animal subjects ethical? So what we find is generally people say that research on animal subjects is less ethical, so they're more likely to say no to this question than they are to the human uh, subjects ethical question. Now, I'm not here to judge your specific uh, morality in terms of animal or, or human research. That's, that's not the point. But I am trying to give you the background of, of where human subject and animal subject research policies come from and how they are implemented today. Now, a lot of this you do obviously remember, get, you're gonna get a lot of this in your city training, but let's get a little bit more, uh, talk a little bit more about some of these subjects and, and kind of delineate what's important for you to understand. Who decides what research should and should not be done? So in the United States, there's a specific amount of guidelines, but these things depend on a variety of different, uh, different um, circumstances, right? and also certain definitions. So it's really not just a, oh, well, you know, then Health and Human Services gets to decide what is and what isn't. That's not the way it works. Uh, we gotta go through a few things. So the first thing we should know is that let's go ahead and make some standards uh, of things that we wanna talk about. So for example, the definition of what research means. This definition actually comes from what's called the common rule. This is the federal law regarding human subjects research in the United States. And in this case, they say that research means a systematic investigation, including research development, testing, and evaluation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. Now, this is actually a big deal because what we think about as research kind of depends on what's going on here. When we talk about human subjects research specifically, this is where we're going. Systematic investigation, including research development, testing, and evaluation, designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. Now, you remember when we talked about different kinds of publications that can happen in psychology? We talked about empirical journal articles, meta-analyses, et cetera. Well, when we're talking about human subjects research, we're talking about things that should go to generalizable knowledge. And normally when we're talking about generalizable knowledge, we're talking about knowledge that's going to be published in some form. Generally, publications like an empirical journal article. But it can also mean something like uh, something that's going to be uh, in a uh, an academic um, convention or 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 meeting uh, where it will be published generally for general use. So the reason why we want to delineate this is because there are certain rules according to the federal government in the United States that must be followed when you're using a human uh, for research and uh, research purposes that don't have to be followed if it doesn't count as research purposes. So specifically. These definitions generally apply to agencies that receive federal funding for research, meaning research that's meant to be published, meant to be sent out to the universe. Now, this is different. This is important because there's some things that don't count as research. So, for example, if Coca-Cola wants to do a taste test, that sounds like research, and they, they might ask actual humans to do it, but it's not research because it's not meant for generalizable knowledge, meaning knowledge that's going to be published for the outside world, that's for internal marketing purposes. And so it doesn't count the same way. Also, the Coca-Cola Corporation is not receiving federal uh, tax money for that research purpose, right? So they're not getting a grant. However, a university is, a university or a public uh, institution like, um, like the USDA or the, you know, something like that, might be might be receiving federal funding. So for example, the University of Colorado at Boulder is an institution that receives a lot of federal funding for their uh, research. And so when they do research, 
anything that's meant to contribute to generalizable knowledge and includes, in this case, a human subject, then they've got to go and they've got to obey this law and the proper ethical guidelines. Now, research does not include some other things. And that, in, that for example, um, when you're doing journalism, that doesn't count. If you're just collecting data for purely educational or internal purposes, right? So for example, a survey that, that I might do about this class, if I'm only using it for my own educational purposes and not for generalizable published knowledge, then I wouldn't have to go through all of the same um, steps that you would have to if you were doing uh, research that you intended to publish. So not only do we have to define what research is, something that we want to intend to publish, and we also need to define a human subject. A human subject means a living individual about whom an investigator, whether professional or student, is conducting research obtains one, data through intervention or interaction with the individual, or two, identifiable private information. Now, the reason why this is such a big deal is because some things are not human subjects. Now, these are quotes, again, from the common rule, which is the federal law about this. That means a human subject needs to be a living person. So someone who's passed away is not a human subject anymore. And data that you've gotten uh, that's, that's already out in some sort of um, collected archive, for example, is probably not going to count as human subjects research in this particular case because you did not directly intervene and interact with that person. So, for example, if you are doing an interview with someone to learn about their experience with uh, depression, then that would be almost certainly human subjects research. But if you were collecting data that had already been collected in you know, previously published journals or databases or something like that, then that would not be human subjects, uh, at least humans, it would be research, but not human subjects research in this particular case. And so you would not have to go through the same steps. So here's what we're saying. For the law in the United States, research has to be something that you intend to publish. And these rules are really for people who are receiving federal funds to do human subjects research, which means that you're probably gonna interact, you're gonna interact with them personally in order to, um, uh, to get that information. By the way, personally does include online. So if you are getting directly from that person the information, you're almost certainly counting as human subjects. But it has to be for the purpose of generalizable knowledge and not just for internal purposes to see you know, if, if a you know, human resource policy inside your company is effective. That's not the same thing. All right, we need to go through a timeline of international ethics for human subjects. Now, this is an, an important point because if you remember, a lot of students nowadays um, consider animal research to be less ethical than human subjects research. By the way, we don't, we shouldn't technically call them subjects anymore. Human subjects, uh, it sounds like they don't have uh, the ability to say no. So we, nowadays we like to say participants instead of subjects. But in the past, that wasn't always the case, that they participated on their own uh, free will and choice. And so we'll talk about this. Let's start with the Nuremberg Code. So directly after World War II, when the entire world understood what was really happening in Nazi Germany, uh, they got together and they were the Nuremberg Trials. The Nuremberg Trials tried uh, the war, cr war criminals um, for war crimes and for crimes against humanity. And in this, in this criminal undertaking, in this, this uh, trial, I should say, uh, was really kind of the first time that people understood the extent of the Holocaust that happened and were rightly outraged because of it. So I'll get back to this in just a second. The Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials uh, were the war crimes trials. After, or kind of connected with that, they created what's called the Nuremberg Code because if you remember, one of the main atrocities that was uh, that was committed against uh, against Jewish people and and others um, during the Holocaust was that they were included in scientific research against their will, and so there was certain uh, scientific tests that the Nazis did on them against their will, and uh, many were killed. Others were, you know, otherwise greatly harmed. This was so appalling 
that they created what's called the Nuremberg Code. In the Nuremberg Code, we actually have specific information about how we should treat people. It was the first time that people got together and said, you know what, when we're doing scientific research, we need to make sure that something like the Holocaust could never happen again. And so one of these, one of, so they have a, the code of how you should actually perform research. And this led to them uh, including one specific caveat that said, whenever possible, instead of using humans, you should use animals so that you don't end up like the Nazis where, people, where the Nazis were doing, um, were doing studies on humans that they could have done on animals or something else. So in reality, what we have now in the system of the way that we do research today in science, where we have a delineation between human subjects and animal subject research, a lot of that comes from the idea of the Nuremberg trials, where very unethical uh, studies were being done on humans. And they said, well, what you should be doing is doing those on animals so that you don't do them, those on humans. So that is kind of the background of where these came from, at least on a general sense. And then after that, there was something called the Declaration of Helsinki, which was a sort of treaty that many countries, including the United States, signed on to saying these will be the, the standards that we will adhere to when we do research, including humans. Specific to the United States, then we created what's called the Belmont Report. So this is in 1979, researchers got together and created uh, a guideline of what would constitute ethical research for human subjects. And in the Belmont Report, they delineated the three factors, and these three factors are important, beneficence, justice, and respect for persons. So beneficence, justice, and respect for persons. Beneficence is, does the good outweigh the bad? Does the, uh, does the progress, the knowledge, the benefit outweigh the cost for the participant? Does the benefit outweigh the cost for the participant? So this doesn't include, when we talk about benefits, we're not talking about like compensation. We're not talking about, hey, we're getting paid here. We're talking about, does this research really gonna benefit the participants more than it's gonna harm them? So for example, uh, some people say that the Milgram experiment, uh, which we'll talk about later on as to whether or not it was an experiment, but the Milgram study, um, does it really, does the benefit outweigh the cost, right? Does the benefit of understanding uh, obedience outweigh the cost of believing that you basically killed somebody? So beneficence is that question. Does the benefit outweigh the cost? Justice has to do with groups of people. There are, so for example, we've already talked about the Holocaust and how, for example, the Jewish people were, uh, were made to um, be the subjects, the group, the, that group, Jewish people, were made to be the subjects of this uh, particular study. Now, this also includes other groups that might be at risk, at risk of uh, being unduly uh, included, not because of their, their lack of power, for example. So, for example, uh, the Tuskegee um, the Tuskegee syphilis studies Tuskegee syphilis studies included a lot of uh, inmates in uh, or incarcerated people um, in a prison who were included in a study of syphilis and were unethically um, exposed to syphilis uh, and many suffered or even died because of that. So what we're trying to do in justice is say, hey, are we unduly looking at a specific group that might be of a lower power or ability and taking too much information from them and not spreading out the burden of being a participant in research to a wide variety of people? So for example, are there groups like uh, incarcerated people or religious or ethnic or racial groups that are, that are um, unduly being uh, incorporated as participants in these studies? Respect for persons is more about an individual idea, things of confidentiality and consent. So for example, when you participate in the study, you have to consent in order to be in that study. You also have to make sure that in, in whatever way is possible, your information is kept confidential. So those are ideas of respect for persons. Beneficence is, does the benefit outweigh the cost? Justice, is any group being unduly, uh, un, unduly infringed on? 
in the form of this, uh, this research. And respect for persons is the individual's rights, things like uh, consent, confidentiality, freedom to withdraw whenever you want, et cetera. The Belmont Report then led to the law being established in the United States. And that law, and the, uh, the federal law, is called the common rule. The common rule is the federal guideline, like we talked about in those definitions, which is for any agency receiving federal funds and requires what's called an IRB for any human subjects research. IRB is an institutional review board. It is a committee of people that are required to, um, to say whether or not this particular research is ethical and follows the guidelines that it needs to. So let's go through these a little bit. We talked about Nuremberg Code. The common rule, let's talk about this. So the common rule, after the Belmont Report was established, the common rule was created into law, revised in 2018, which was specifically saying, here is the law regarding, um, regarding how research needs to be done when you have human participants. The biggest thing about this that's important for you to understand is that it requires an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, for any human subjects research. So anything that counts as research that includes human subjects according to the definition in receiving federal funds has to have an institutional review board. The IRB, Institutional Review Board, is done within the institution. So for example, the University of Colorado Boulder has their own IRB and they are the ones who determine whether or not guidelines of ethics are being followed. For example, beneficence, justice, respect for persons, those kind of things. They want to know specifically, how are you going to make sure that people consent? How are you going to make sure that, that things are kept confidential? What exactly are you going to make every person do? Do they have the right to withdraw whenever they need to, et cetera? So that is the rule. When we talk about the common rule, this is the law about using human subjects in the United States. And it requires the use of the IRB. So let's do, uh, let's look at an example. Let's look at Middle Mist et al. study. So I'm going to show it to you and then I'll ask you this question. This is a study that was done, and you'll see when it was done. This was done in 1976. Now remember, the uh, Belmont Report was in 1979, so this was done even before the Belmont Report. There was no IRB here. Nobody had to go through an IRB. This is one example of how um, of debate that happens now in terms of what is or is not ethical regarding human participant research. So this is called personal space invasions in the laboratory, uh, suggested evidence for arousal. So if you look through this particular abstract, you will see that what they did is they went to a lavatory. That means a bathroom, a public bathroom. And what they were looking at is a, in this case, it was a, a men's room. There were three urinals and they were trying to figure out whether or not having somebody in your personal space created what they called arousal. Traditionally, some men have used the term stage fright. Here's what it means. Can you urinate if somebody's standing right next to you? That's what they're going for. They wanna see whether or not people can actually urinate when somebody's sitting next to them. So the, what they did is they had the three stalls, uh, sorry, not the three stalls, the three urinals, and then next to the urinals was a stall. And basically they, as people came in, men came in, they uh, had different situations. One where there was a stall between uh, the next person urinating or one where the, the person urinating was right next to them. And they timed how long it took them to urinate. They did this by Basically, the person who is sitting down in the stall next to the urinal had a little periscope thing. They watched to see uh, when the, the male started to actually release urine. They didn't ask them permission. They just did this and then let the guy leave. So the question is, is this particularly ethical? More particularly, would it pass the IRB today? 
in order to answer this question, what you've got to determine is the, those ideas of, uh, of the Belmont Report. Beneficence. Does the, uh, does the benefit outweigh the cost? Does understanding ideas of arousal and personal space outweigh the cost of having been a part of this study? Two, justice. Is any group particularly being um, unduly used or unduly, um, not necessarily even required, but uh, pressured to be a part of the study? And three, respect for persons. Is there confidentiality? Is there consent, et cetera? Now, many people would say that this is not okay today. And mainly they would say it probably based off the idea of consent and confidentiality. None of the participants who were watched to see when they were urinating consented to be a part of the study. Now, Middle Mist uh, responds to this saying, well, this is a good conversation, but we should remember that, that public restrooms are public. And so when people go in there, they should assume to be public. So there's a lot of debate as to whether or not this would or would not pass an IRB, but certainly they did not have any uh, consent. Um, they also didn't know that they were part of the study. What they did find though, is that men who had to stand right next to another man took longer to urinate. And so there does seem to be something going on there. Now, that is a smaller study. That is a smaller kind of a study compared to Tuskegee, compared to the Milgram experiment, compared to the Stanford prison study, et cetera, which by the way, those, uh, those included ideas of consent um, in those. Now, whether they could withdraw at any time in a reasonable way is a separate issue. But those ideas are really what we're talking about when we're talking about the IRB and what does or does not pass. I will assure you that the IRB today is strict. And whenever you participate in a study, you will see that they had to go through quite a bit to know how and what should and shouldn't happen in that study. Uh, I promise you the IRB is strict. In fact, researchers often complain about the IRB, not because we don't like ethics in our research, but because they're so strict and they require a lot of information to make sure that people are protected. Does this mean that someone could never be shocked, for example, in a study? Well, you actually could be shocked in a study. However, you would have consented very specifically uh, to be shocked, and you would know very specifically that you were going to be shocked, what the intensity level is, et cetera. There are very strict protocols. I'm not saying that we don't do studies on human subjects that aren't uncomfortable or don't involve cost. I'm saying that these are very strictly um, looked at through the IRB and debated as well. So that's what you should know about the IRB. Here is a review question. Beneficence is a principle first defined in the? The answer to this is the Belmont Report. This was defined in the Belmont Report. The Belmont Report then led to the common rule, which is the federal law regarding human subjects research. Okay, let's go ahead and end there.